that is a humbling thing to talk to God. It was so funny. I was, I was in the prayer room praying. I always do that before I preach. I was in the prayer room praying because at first service, I could see on their faces they weren't tracking with what I was saying. That's like the worst thing as a pastor. You're looking at the people and you're thinking, There's a, well, there wasn't like a ton of people in here anyways because of the snow. But I was like, I think half this room is not picking up what I'm laying down. You know, well, they, they got the rah-rah parts, but the deep theology parts, they were like, you're losing us. And it was funny, I was praying about that back in the prayer room. And it was like God said, why don't you try it like this? And so I wasn't paying attention to what was happening out here. And I thought, oh my gosh, was that the second song? And then I ran out and I told Daniel, was that the second song? So I said, yeah, it was the second song. I said, okay, God just revealed something to me back in there, and it's pretty powerful. And as we were walking up here to pray, I said, hurry up so I don't forget. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's full disclosure, I mean, if we're being honest, you know what I mean? So, all right, I want to get to it, okay? I really want to get to it so it's clear, okay? First of all, in this series, this is a powerful thought. It's a very, very powerful thought. On January the 4th, I went to visit Miss Sarah, okay? Those of you that know Miss Sarah know who I'm talking about. Sits right here, used to sit right here. 99-year-old African-American woman uh, will turn 100 on 4 April 20th this year, she turns 100. Hope she makes it to that date, but she's quickly deteriorating, okay? Doing well. And I said it for a service, I said, I, I'm probably violating some confidentiality here, but I know Miss Sarah well, and I don't think she'll care that I tell you this. What she said to me when I went to visit her was, I hope as I go to heaven, I do so with full strength. That's powerful. That's powerful. Okay, obviously, does she have full physical strength? No. I mean, if you saw her, if you visited her, you would know that. But that's a powerful thought. Moses went to heaven with full strength. Caleb went to heaven with full strength. Joshua went to heaven with full strength. How, how do you experience death with full strength? That's a powerful thought, okay? You're not going to come up with that, the answer to that over Sunday lunch today, okay? That will require thought. Years ago, when I was a kid, there was this book that my grandmother told me about. It's called when bad things happen to good people, trying to answer the big question. I've always heard that question. This sermon series is ultimately about why bad things happen to good people, but how we go through the bad things and ultimately die with full strength, okay? That's what this sermon series is all about. That's what I said last week when I said when I had the illness that I had for the seven weeks that I had it, these are the things that God was teaching me during this time. So that's the context for what we're talking about. Before we start talking about the balance of living in the foundation of the one who overcame sin and death, um, while the circumstances of sin and death are still present in this world, I, I felt it necessary to talk about Jesus' actual victory. And this is where I was kind of confusing the people theologically at first service. So what God told me in the prayer room was after you and I just talked in the restroom, so we may not have that theological debate after all. So, anyways, let's get to it. Thesis statement for this entire series. In and through Christ, eternal victory over sin and death is a settled matter. Okay? Eternal victory over sin and death is a settled matter. Still, we live in a world where the presence and the effects of darkness and evil are still present. Okay? I've officiated 1,500 funerals. I've been around a lot of death, okay? I was really sick for seven weeks. Both of my hot water tanks went out over the course of one week. Whether it's death, illness, or financial immediacy and annoyance, it's all the effects of sin and death in this world. And we have to see that. That's important. It's not just someone died. Not just someone's sick. Not just, oh my gosh, I wasn't expecting to spend $2,000 on two hot water tanks. You see what I'm saying? 
It's all of those things, and those things are present in our life. And if Jesus has settled sin and death, why am I still having to buy hot water tanks? Why do I still have to go to the funeral home? Why am I still sick, and he's not healing me in this moment? Does that make sense? Why do bad things happen to good people if good people are trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to overcome sin and death? Does that make sense? Okay, keep walking the thesis. And so, until the culmination of the kingdom of God, the sons and daughters of the living God are to live our lives fighting to advance light and goodness because we know victory is a settled matter. So when my hot water tanks go out, how do I not stomp and kick and snort and pout? You just pay for the water tanks and you go on. You see what I'm saying? When someone passes away, how do I reflect the light of God's glory in the midst of the darkness of death? Does that make sense? How do we do that? That's what this sermon series is all about, okay? So for today, before we get into that balance, let's talk about Jesus' victory. We'll, 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 25% of the sermon is about the balance and leads into next week, okay? But 75% of the sermon is about the victory of Christ. What is the scriptural account of Jesus' victory over sin and death? That's 75% of the sermon. And then I have three verses of scripture. I actually have a quote by Mike Krzyzewski, and then three scriptures, and we'll talk about the balance of the two, which will lead into the next three sermons that we're going through, okay? What's the scriptural account of Jesus' victory over sin and death? And while the effects of sin and death are still present and felt among us until the culmination of the kingdom of God, we have every right to decide where we choose to found our lives, okay? So, go ahead, Nathan. Champions on victory. I love this, okay? Belichick retires this week. Saban retires this week. shashevsky has been retired for a while. Let me give you two quotes on victory by Belichick and Saban for the first 75% of the sermon, and then we'll, we'll close with, with Krzyzewski. I love this quote, and don't just think about it in terms of six Super Bowl championships by the Patriots. Think about it in terms of Jesus' victory over the ultimate Super Bowl, Okay, sin and death, all right? Talent sets the floor. Character sets the ceiling. The identity that we are is the baseline. How we live out that identity in the world is the ceiling. Was Jesus born fully God, fully human? Yes, talent. But character had to live the entire life, had to live the sinless life and die on the cross so that he'd faced everything and the enemy had nothing left to put on him. Talent, ceiling, birth in Bethlehem, death on Golgotha. Make sense? All right, Saban. I had to clean this one up a little bit. I couldn't put the whole quote in church. (laughs) Guys would have had to take a pastoral vote on me after the service. How much does this game mean to you? Isn't this what Daniel and I yell at you about every week? Does this Christianity thing really mean anything to you? How much did it mean to Jesus? I love this thing that Jesus says, okay? And I think the enemy got wise to it after a while. Jesus said, do you think I came here to do my own will? I didn't come here to do my own will. I came to do the will of the Father, which was the what? What was the will of the Father? Put his son on a cross. That was the will of the Father. And to finish the work. It's not enough to just come and live the life. I've got to actually get to Golgotha and die on the cross. I came to do the will of the Father and finish the work. How much does this game mean to you? Because if it means something to you, you can't stand still. Talent has to grow into character. You understand? You play fast. You play strong. You go out there and dominate the guy you're playing against and make him quit. See, I fully believe that this is ultimately what Jesus did with the cross. That the enemy put everything on Jesus and said, we got nothing left and he keeps going. And that's where Jesus said, huh, I guess I took it all. It's accomplished. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. See, I fully believe that's what Jesus did. That's our MO as a team. That's what people know us as. When you look at Jesus, that's what people know him as. If you're going to make it through death, sickness, and hot water tanks, is that how people know you? See what I'm saying? So, there's the two quotes there. Now, 
What's the scriptural account of Jesus' victory over sin and death with those things in mind? Well, for years, my theology was based around this book. Okay, go ahead, Nathan. You can put it up on the screen. My theology was based around this book. When I was a little boy, my mom said, hey, there's a cartoon on that I want you to watch. I was like, okay, what is it? She said, it's a book. It's called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's about a lion who is Jesus and a witch who is Satan and how God works his plan of salvation. Well, I was in. You know, I'd just given my life to Jesus. I'm in. So I go downstairs, I watch this thing, and for the last 44 years of my life, you know, I've loved this book. About eight or nine years ago, though, my theology started to shift. This was my original theology, and it's what C.S. Lewis says in this story, okay? So after Aslan the lion is resurrected from the dead, he says this to the kids that he was working with. It means, said Aslan, that though the witch knew the deep magic, there's a magic deeper still which she didn't know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time. But if she could have looked farther back into the stillness and darkness before time dawn, she would have read there a different incantation. And this is the part here. This line right here is the part of my theology that shifted. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backward. And now, oh yes, now, said Lucy, jumping up and clapping her hands. So, so track with me here. What's that theology? And I know I'm going to mess with some of you right now. Some of you are like, you, you may like shut me off right now because you guys believe in, in what I'm about to say. I just don't believe it anymore. That Jesus took my place on the cross. Oh gosh, Kevin just said that. I think it's a bigger answer than that. Because I think when we live with that answer, we almost pull the actuality out of it and make it too conceptual. I believe that Jesus went to the cross in order to actually go where we were and bring us out. I think that's what the resurrection of the dead is all about, okay? It's not as much about a traitor dying, in a, it's a, 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 a pure person dying in a traitor's stead. It's about going to where all the traitors are and getting the traitors the heck out of Dodge through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'll let you think about that long after Sunday lunch. I've been thinking about this for a decade. Give it time in your own lives. Let me show you something that I wrote in 17. I once believed C.S. Lewis and so many others that Satan wanted the Messiah dead, but I believe this less and less. Part of Satan's post-resurrection lie is to provide a hero in villains. When we have a hero who cries, forgive them for they know not what they're doing, then we can place blame. We place blame somewhere else and we're not taking personal responsibility. We blame Satan, the demons, Judas, Pilate, Caiaphas, and Annas. And all the while, we conceptually view our own sins hanging upon the cross, which we never take hold of with deep actuality. Certainly, faith is assured with many. Okay, I'm not denying your Christianity in here any more than I'm denying my own. But still, Christians attempt to control both our salvation and sanctification when it's the willful father alone who choreographed the crucifixion of the surrendered son. Pause. That's hard for some people because we believe that it was a witch that killed the lion. We believe that it's the devil who killed Jesus. No. I fully believe it's the father that orchestrated the whole thing. Why would Satan orchestrate the one thing that was going to bring sin and death's demise. And if it was the Father's will to take the Son to the cross and kill Him, and Jesus knew this all along and said, you think I'm here to do my own will? I'm not here to do my own will. I'm here to do the Father's will and finish the work. And what's the work? Dying on a cross. You have to give thought to this. You have to give thought to this. Now, I'm going to address the whole killing of Jesus thing here in a second. That's what the Lord just said 
tell them this out there. It'll make it more clear, okay? <laughs> but you've got to think about this because if you can see the pain, the struggle that Jesus went through on a daily basis, hot water tanks, he bore my sicknesses and carried my diseases, you're going to get sick. I am crucified with Christ. You'll see the fullness, you'll root and foundation, and you will die with full strength. It's pretty cool. Okay? The conductor had orchestrated humanity to play the dirge that brought about our own reconciliation. And I believe more and more that Satan wasn't trying to kill the Messiah. Hold it on this slide. Satan wasn't trying to kill the Messiah, but rather to stop his crucifixion from ever happening. All right, so watch this. The platform is the heavenlies. The floor is the earth. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always knew after Adam and Eve had sinned that the only way to reconcile humanity was the cross of Jesus Christ. In the heavenlies, the enemy at one point believed if we kill him, we can put a stop to all of this. But at some point realized we don't have any control over his death, so he's going to that cross. We've got to put a stop to it. Earth. Jesus takes on flesh and recognizes I'm going to the cross, but he takes on flesh. And there's times where he says, let this cup pass from me, because we all struggle, even Jesus. And we have a high priest who connects with us in every struggle, but not my will, but your will be done. You with me? You tracking? Yes, it never moves. Initially, we try to kill him, but next we try to submit him. Because if he goes to that cross, we're in big trouble. I'm going to the cross, but I struggle with it. And then on this side, you have humanity, who God is either hardening so that they'll act to kill, steal, and destroy, or he is fortifying grace so they'll move Jesus towards the cross. Does that make sense? Let's see it in real time. Let me show you here how Jesus orchestrated. Now, this is the beginning, because you can't deny that the enemy didn't try to kill Jesus. It happened many times. When Mary was pregnant, Joseph had every right to kill her with stoning and kill him too. And if he doesn't live the full life, you know, he's got to go through all of that. So the enemy is trying to kill, all right? Herod trying to kill in Bethlehem. Archelaus trying to kill when they're coming back from Egypt. Nazareth, they try to pitch him off the cliff, okay? Multiple times they take up stones to stone him. Well, why didn't they just kill him? Because they didn't have the authority over his life and death. Remember what Jesus says? It's recorded in the Gospel of John. You, you think you have the power to kill me? You don't have the power to kill me. I have the power to lay my life down and take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So at some point the enemy goes, oh, we can't kill him. He's in charge of his own death, and he's heading towards that cross. So we've got to do everything we can to submit him. Hold that thought. We'll come back to that. So how is God, with this group of people who have hard hearts, who are trying to bring about Jesus' death, while the enemy's going, what are you doing? We don't want to kill him. And how is God, through great people, bringing him to the cross, and declaring that he is king. That's a powerful thought. This is it. Judas, he was born to betray. That's a powerful thought. I'm not going to move. Judas was born to betray. Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin. Hearts are hard. They try to kill him. You see what I'm saying? Multitudes who remind Pilate, you owe us one. Give us Barabbas. Hard hearts move Jesus to the cross. Barabbas, oh, thank God, I got a free pass. Hard heart moves Jesus to the cross. Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin, 
Yell, yell, crucify, crucify. Hard hearts move Jesus towards the cross. Pilate has the power to let him go, doesn't let him go ultimately, and gives a death sentence. Hard heart moves him to the cross. Now wait a second. Simon of Cyrene? He's not a bad guy in the story, is he? He's a good guy, isn't he? Isn't he the one that helps Jesus? But I want you to think about that. If he carried his cross to Golgotha, Mr. Police Officer, isn't he an accessory to murder? Is that good or is that bad? Sit on that over lunch today and for the next 10 years. Is Simon of Cyrene a good guy or a bad guy? Doesn't the good guy say, forget this cross, I'm carrying you and we're out of here? No. He carries his cross to Golgotha and has a hand in Jesus' crucifixion. Is he a good guy or a bad guy? The soldiers doing their job to crucify him. Pilate, wait a second, I thought Pilate said he should die. Why at the same thing did he say, this is the king of the Jews? This is the savior. How can you crucify him and give him a commendation of Christ at the same time? God's orchestrating the whole thing. The confessing thief's encouragement. The support of John, Mary, and the other women are at the base of the cross. This is fascinating. But the reality is, God saw it through to the end. Always going to die. Initially wanted him dead, and then said, oh gosh, we can't do that. We've got to submit him. Knows he needs to die, but has to work it through. Humanity. God used with bad, hardening of the heart, okay? And God doesn't do evil, but sometimes he har uses a hardness of heart in order to move people in a direction they need to go. And then someone like Simon of Cyrene, who had a good heart, and ultimately brought about the crucifixion. That's powerful when you think about it. Powerful. Satan, how did he try to stop it? The agony of Gethsemane, the possession of Judas, the disciples' garden actions. They didn't support Jesus. They slept. And then they tried to stop it all from happening, okay? Disjointed testimony at trial. It's Jesus who ultimately says, okay, fine, you guys are messing this up. I'm, I'm the Christ. Oh, blasphemy, okay? Simon Peter's three-time denial. Beatings and mocking. Pilate declares him innocent. Pilate's wife dream. Have nothing to do with that man. Herod mocks and says there's no basis for the charge. Pilate beats him and says there's no basis for the charge. The entire cohort mocks. Way to the cross and journey. Six hours of spiritual darkness. Six hours of physical crucifixion and agony. And I want you to think about this. The enemy says you don't have to die on that cross. Just come down and show us you're the Messiah. Show us you're the Son of God. It was true at the beginning of his public ministry. It was true at the end of his public ministry. It's the same exact temptation. Do you see all the ways that Satan tries to get Jesus to quit? And he never quits. That's powerful. And it's worth our time to think about. Okay? All of that while I was praying in the five minutes in the prayer room. Guess what? I didn't say that at all at first service. So consider yourself blessed, all right? Next, okay? I love this passage because we begin to transition into the suffering and the victory that can be present all at once. When you look at Psalm 22, it's not enough to read the first words. You have to read it in the fullness, okay? Psalm 22 begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did this person die? Why am I sick? You know, why do I have to pay $2,000 in order to get one hot water tank replaced and one fixed? It's all the same thing. And tell me you haven't been there. Whether it's death, illness, or frankly, I don't need this annoyance right now. Okay? I was just sick. Now my hot water tanks go out? Are you kidding me, God? I don't want to sweep water off of my floor. We've all been there. Where are you, God? And yet, if you finish Psalm 22, the last part says this, that they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he 
has done it. I've come to do the Father's will and to finish the work. So when Jesus is hanging on the cross, which psalm does he choose to quote while he's hanging there? Psalm 22. And it's a lesson that he's giving to the five or six people that are there, the, the, John and the four ladies who are with him, saying, okay, finish the psalm. This was something that rabbis did in that day. They'd start a psalm and expect you to finish it. So when Jesus is hanging there, yeah, he's struggling. You wouldn't be, you know, you know, he's struggling. And so he cries this out, but not from a point of defeat. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You can go ahead and shift it, Nathan. He's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Saying to people, look, it will be bad sometimes. You will experience death. You will experience illness. You will experience annoyance. And it'll seem like God's a million miles away. But don't put a period on the end of that sentence. Put a comma knowing that I have defeated sin and death. And that's what it says. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then Jesus says, it is finished. He has done it. Do you see what I'm saying? It is accomplished. Jesus' crucifixion is a real living out of Psalm 22. The enemy looks and says, we have put everything on him. He bore everything. They had nothing left to put on him. And Jesus says, I guess that's it. I've shouldered it all. It is accomplished. It is finished. Not me, him. I have done it. Wow. What begins with my God, my God, ends with it is finished. Where do you choose to place your foundation? My God, my God? Or acknowledge my God, my God, and say it is finished. Oh my gosh, that's powerful. Go ahead. The Father's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For the Father's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. That's why I said to, to pay off a debt, is, is, it's too short. It's, it's too short a theology. Jesus actually went to hell and led the captives out. He rescued us. And I love this last part, okay? He forgave us all our sins having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. There it is. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities. He took everything from them. They had nothing left. I whipped you. You lost. I win. Humanity can be free because I've defeated sin and death. That's powerful. That's powerful. He made a public spectacle of them. How did he win? Triumphing over them by the cross. That's powerful. A couple more scriptures. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open. The bodies of many people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tomb after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. That's powerful. People were actually resurrected from the dead when Jesus defeated sin and death. And the crazy thing about it is, and I'm not trying to be silly by this, the crazy thing about this is, <laughs> that Friday afternoon, at 3 o'clock, their spirits come back into their bodies because Jesus defeats sin and death. But for Friday afternoon, all night and day Saturday and Sunday morning, they just stood there. Why? They're not the Lord of all. He is. And so for those folks physically and for everyone who will follow him spiritually, he leads us from sin and death. Does that make sense? That's powerful. To each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives so get this, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, 
physically speaking for some, but for all who will follow him spiritually, he says to those who are held captive in sin and death, you don't have to be a captive anymore. You can walk out with me. And no matter what you face in life, no matter what you experience, whether it's death, illness, or a hot water tank going out, you can stand founded in Christ. Nothing has to hold you anymore. You can die with full strength. Wow, that is powerful. Go ahead, Nathan. When I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. This is John on the island of Patmos. Years and years after Jesus' ascension into heaven after the resurrection. And then Jesus placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I love that. No matter what you face, death, illness, annoyance, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm the first. I'm the last. I'm the living one. I love this. You know what? I was dead. I was. But you look. I am alive forever and ever. No matter what you experience, I am alive forever and ever. And guess who holds the keys of Hades and death? It isn't the enemy. I hold them now. I hold them now. And for those who choose to surrender to that, that's your life. That's your life. And you can live that strength. All right, final 25%. While the effects of sin and death are still present and felt among us until the culmination of the kingdom of God, we have every right to decide where we choose to found our lives. Back to Coach Krzyzewski. He's talking about coaching Kobe, LeBron, all the best on the Olympic team a few years ago. How do you manage all those egos. And the number one he thing he said about making sure that they all maintain their still, you know, global perfection of talent, and yet making a team, a oneness team, all right? That's what he said. I, I just found it telling. The demons step in. <laughs> you have to address it right away. You don't let bad fester. You don't let bad fester. You get rid of bad right away. You want as much good to fester as possible, but bad needs to be eliminated right away. Bad can grow faster than good, I think. It seems that way. And see, that's why we say to you guys every week, why in the world would you give the devil a foothold? It's hard when somebody dies. It's hard when somebody gets sick. It's even hard sometimes when there's an annoyance there. It was funny, after that second hot water tank broke, I just went, oh my gosh. I need to go get a cup of coffee. And I went downstairs and I have this really new, or really nice new Nespresso coffee machine, which I absolutely love. And guess what I did right after the hot water tank busted? I knocked the water tank on the Nespresso over and it went all over me. So you see what I'm saying? It's, it, it, it doesn't that always happen? Like everything goes wrong and then you get pulled over by the police. No offense, Joey. <laughs> Do you see, like, I need another thing in my life. But if you allow that to fester and fester and fester, you forget the victory that you possess in Jesus Christ. Three scriptures and we're done. Here we go. What about you, Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, on this rock, the confession that Jesus is the Christ, I will build my church. And look at that. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. If the confession of your life, if the foundation of your life is Jesus Christ, the gates of Hades will never be able to overcome you. And if Jesus possesses the keys to those gates, are you playing offense or are you playing defense? The enemy wants to tell you, you have to defend yourself against me. And Jesus says, no, you don't. Greater is he who's within you than he who's within the world. You're not on defense. You're on offense. I hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, you will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So no matter the weight of what you face before you, you stand, you are founded in the victory of the one who defeated sin and death. So will your foundation be here or will your foundation be here? Second scripture. 
Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Isn't this what Miss Sarah's praying? I know I'm passing away, but I want to taste life every single day that I live. I'll spare you the example that I gave at first service. I said every single day, Miss Sarah spits death out of her mouth. You can spit death out of your mouth every day even though it swirls all around you all the time. Third scripture, and we're done. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock, on this rock. I build my church. What is the church? It's not a building. It's not an institution. It's not an organization. It's the sons and daughters of the living God. Think about that. Like a wise man who built his house on the rock, okay? And what's the rock? The rock is Jesus' defeat of sin and death. And when we confess that, that is the life, and that is where it is built. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. I wish to God I could say Bad things will never happen to you, good people. But Jesus says they will. The rain is going to come down in your life. The streams will rise. The wind is going to beat against the house that you are. But you don't have to fall because it has a foundation in the rock. That's all I'm asking you to do. Just build. Dig your footers in the victory of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And no matter what comes your way, no matter what comes your way, you'll withstand it because you're founded in the right place. Come at the hell of death, the high water of sickness, or frankly, the absolute annoyance of two hot water tanks. You'll stand firm in Christ. That's it. Victory is won. Rescue is afforded to all. And even though the effects of sin and death remain, you can live your life founded in life more abundant. Will you choose to live life in such a way? Father, thank you so much for this message today. And as I did say at first service, it's not just a message. It's the truth of this world. It's the reality in which we are living, God. And I pray that Everyone here today welcomes that truth into their life. That they say, okay, fine. I realize that the world is going to keep coming after me. I realize as I get older, my body's going to break down. But I can be ready for your return or ready for my home going with full strength because my life is founded in your victory, Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that over everybody today, and I pray that everyone says yes to that truth. Jesus, thank you. It's kind of interesting that we go from that sermon straight into Holy Communion, talking about your death, burial, and resurrection in this meal. And maybe today, people could say as they come forward, I'm making my confession today. I'm building my life in the rock. I'm digging my footers deep in Jesus and his victory over sin and death. I pray that's what people say today. And so Jesus, thank you for your body that's represented in this bread. And thank you for this blood that's represented, or your blood that's represented in this juice. You gave your body. It was beat up and battered for us. You gave your blood, which is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the remission of sin. God, would you sanctify these elements in this moment? And as I take this blessed sacrament, would you move in people's hearts to say, yes, I want to found my life in you.
thank you, Lord. God, you've set the table, you've sanctified the elements, and you've called people to come. Confessing you as their Lord and Savior and declaring that they'll found their lives in you. I pray that each and every person comes. In your precious name that we pray, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you come?